that that system or that collaboration is harder in, in other uh, teams and clubs. But I remember that that was something that I really loved and enjoyed. And I think we need to remember that when we are coaching the beginners and the younger players is we want them to fall in love with the sport. We want to retain them in our sport and we want to make sure that they're learning all these key fundamentals. So one of the things I remember from my commerce set under days is always being on a rebound board, working on my wrist, on my forearm, on my passing. And to this day, when people ask me, you know, you're, you're a good passer. How did you become a good passer? I always think back to those, you know, 30 minute increments of just being on a rebound board, kind of working on my range and making sure that I had developed those fundamentals and skills. And then now that I am coaching um, beginner water polo players, and I specifically have been coaching um, non aquatic water polo beginners. Um, because some of my mission is to kind of try and grow the sport and make it diverse so it's not the son or daughter of an Olympian or the son or daughter of a collegiate water polo player, someone that has already had some prior knowledge. So with my beginner club teams, I don't necessarily have a very formal structured um, practice plan. I think every day I write down a skill or a fundamental that I really want to drill into them. And I do that so that um, I don't get thrown off when only five of my 15 10 and under show up to practice just because um, the commitment level at that at that age is different than the advanced level. So as a, as a coach, um, especially when I stopped playing water polo, I was like, oh no, I need to be hardcore. You know, I had still the Olympian mentality in me, but I realized that that's not the way to go, especially for these younger players, because I want to keep them in the game and I want them to love the game as much as I did. So a few of the things that I did with my really, really beginner kids is like jousting. And I'm sure a lot of you guys know jousting and, you know, teaching correct ball positioning and getting them a little competitive and getting them to work as a team. Um, I do like I tell them no um, alliances, so you have to, you know, everyone for themselves. And then there were times where I did say, you could align yourself with somebody and work together to win this game. But really the things that I focused on were a lot of passing, making sure their egg beater was being done correctly. A lot of kids jump in and I've seen kids at the high school level that are still not egg beatering correctly. So just, um, it may seem repetitive to you all, or it may seem a little boring, but it really is important to spend a lot of time making sure that our beginners have these basic skills and fundamentals. So as they continue to grow, um, coaches don't have to go back and reteach them how to egg beater correctly. Um, so yeah, these are the things that I focus on and just really, really beginner um, water polo players. And now Rico will take us <laughs> from here. Hi guys. Yeah, totally. I mean, I agree hundred percent with Brenda. I actually happened to be a coach when I was, she was a little girl. And let me tell you at a 10 and under, uh, the boys feared her, including <laughs> Tony. Tony was petrified, like having to guard Brenda, you know? So she obviously was taught well, she came from a great program. There's some great people that came out of commerce and, uh, and they teach exactly what she's saying. You know, it's easy to coach when you get kids that come in, like she said, is a son or a daughter or, or, you know, somebody that played, you know, it's in the blood, as they say, it's DNA or whatever. But they have some expectations. But then you get a kid that basically just come in, never seen water polo before. They don't know how to swim. And that's so important, what Brenda just said. And we have to remember, you know, I hate the word potential for that reason. Don't go in there thinking that everybody has the potential to be an Olympian. Go in there that everybody has the potential to have fun. Okay. And if they have the potential to have fun, they're going to enjoy it. If they're going to enjoy it, they're going to come back. I'm going to share real quick. One of the things that all of us, you know, and Brenda believes it, myself, Maggie and Tony, is the idea of, you know, the crawling, the walking, the running, the sprinting. You can't do one without the other. You first learn to crawl. Then you learn to walk. Then you're going to run to run. And then as you get to the Olympian, you're going to sprint. But you know what? Take it easy. We will get there. Let's just go one little bit at a time. Let me share a screen and make sure I do it right. Uh, you know, us old people, we're still trying to figure these things out. Hold on. Let's share the screen right here. Hold on. All right. Uh, I want to share this one right here. This PowerPoint. Let's go. 
All right, here we go. All right. So what we want to do is it, you know, we want, what do we want to accomplish? I mean, like we said before, we, we don't, we're not here uh, just to um, let's just say, oh, you know, we want to out there and work out every day. We're going to make this get, no, we, we, we let, let's see what we really want to go, you know? So the first thing is you got to do is going to crawl. You know, I'm not going to read what it says on the board. Most of you guys have seen there, but the approach is different. You know, the approach of, of crawling, it should be basic skills, emphasizing fun. You know, usually we're talking about the kids all the way between like eight, nine, seven, they should be having fun. Their training should include just games. Ball games, sit on the noodles, you know, the jousting, like, you know, like she said, all right? I mean, uh, once or twice a week is fine, 30 minutes, you know, the rest of the time, let them swim, or let them play basketball, let them do piano. I mean, we don't want to burn these kids out before they even get to the sport, all right? So that, that's very important. Again, when we're talking about walking and run, so we, we're talking about the kids just started. You know, that he's the beginner. He's crawling like what, 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 you know, what Brenda said. And then they're going to start walking and run. That's age group. That's high school. That's the back burner of learning, guys. I mean, if we don't get the kids to really want to play because we burn them out because they, they've got, Mom, I don't want to go to practice. Dad, I don't want to go to practice. But instead, what we want to do is have fun games, have them, things that they do it together. I try to be as creative as I can. You try the things, you know, make the kids enjoy it, all right? Uh, you know, the next thing is that we're going to identify the future. How are we going to do that? We identify, we're developing. Is the talent now or are we thinking about the future? I don't want them to be the greatest nine-year-old in the history of the sport. I have no design, no desire for that. I have no desire for that. I, I, I want the kid to just be a great kid. I want him to enjoy it. So let's talk about it. When they're walking, it's like nine to 12 years old. You know, they crawl, they love it, they want to come back, they're telling mom, I want to be part of this program, they're going to join the club, they're going to enjoy, now they're going to start walking. Their, their training is based on technical skills, emphasis on legs, ball handling introductions, team mental skills. What is team mental skills? That's the ability of the being with somebody else, not being frustrated, enjoying it. That is huge. Okay, Swimming conditioning, concentrating short middle distances. Why are you making a nine-year-old swim 10 200s for? I mean, what they should be doing is swimming well, swimming with confidence, swimming with head up, being able to start, stop. That's the kind of thing. Training, okay? The position is starting to be specific. You're going to have one that's going to be a goalie. There's another one that's thinking about a center, okay? And then you start with competitive drills. Introduce things like four and four. You know, or just play the front court working on the right side or play the front court. It's important to be intelligent in our sport. That is huge in our sport. We move on. He's now turning 13. He's going to get ready. He's getting to that eighth grade, ninth grade. You know, he's going to go to high school. So he swims, becomes a key opponent. They now need to be swimming very hard. Emphasize the counterattack. Counterattack players have a tendency to play more during the game. Emphasize the horizontal, the vertical game. Introduction of tactics, technical excellence. It's not about just doing it now. You have to do it well. So before, when they're walking, you basically say, okay, this is how we, you know, pass the ball. Well, now we get to the running. Now we pass the ball perfectly every time. Okay? And then smart play. I mean, I, I agree with Brenda 100% when she says that you have to be smart. And if you're going to be smart, you're going to find a place to play on that team. And then, of course, by this cycle, the player should have knowledge of all the skills they need. And the mastering the game is only a goal. So what I'm saying is that by the time you're 17 years old, I'm sorry, but by the time you're 17 years old, you should be ready to play at a collegiate level, at the international level. And the only thing that's going to change now is going to be maturity, strength, experience, but the knowledge and the, the learning should, have, should be there already. So as we're talking here, guys, this is one of the things that I want to say. And I get excited about this. I really do. As a coach and anybody that knows me knows that I just love being on deck. I just love you know, the greatest thing in the world to see a player when they look at you and smile. And back is he got it, you know. And then so I, I'm not a yeller. I'm not a screamer. You know, I, I'm more of it. I, I'm talking, you know, and I want these kids to talk, you know, talk with us. And so – when you're designing your program, and later on we'll be talking about a good certification program, because all of us have had many coaches. I've had coaches too when I was a player. 
And so it would be so nice if we have some kind of a certification as we do it. There is in other countries that we can basically pretty much, at least on the basic level, certification is not about excluding anyone. Certification is to be able to have the material, all right? Ha having, let's say, something that we can all follow. So we all know how to teach the egg beater because swimming does. I mean, you, you go in, there is one way to teach the swimming. There's one way to, to, to flip turn. There's one way to start and streamline and all this stuff. But in water polo, a lot of people, and Maggie said, the kids come to a national level, they don't know how to egg beat them. Come on, really? I got a six-year-old and a seven-year-old grandson that already can egg beat her perfectly. And they, trust me, they didn't know it before, but you put them to about two or three exercises and they'll egg beat her fine. You know, so we should have some of those things there. And, that, and that's really important, all right? So this is kind of how I feel. I know that for both for Brenda and I, you know, we've been in age group for a long time. We've both been at the international level, trust us. But we are fanatics about <laughs> the, the age group and, and, and the kids. And, the, you, know, the, you know, this to us is great. So I know we, it was great when, when, when they decided the powers to be, you know, Maggie and Tony said that Brenda and I are going to go together. I was just like, yes. <laughs> you know so go Rico, ahead, I think I think there's a couple questions that were asked in our group and okay. some one of the questions that I think a couple people had is how do you teach these fundamentals and these skills to older players that that join right so a 15 or 14 year old that is discovering water polo for the first time so one thing I would say to you all is if they already have a swimming background, that's a great plus, right? Like I would really get into um, just trying to get them to learn the egg beater as quickly as possible. Um, like Ricardo was saying, sometimes we see older kids that can't egg beater, but even if you just talk to them and you tell them, hey, look, for the first month of this, all we're gonna focus on is is egg beater because if you don't have this foundation down, it's, it's not gonna matter how fast you are. I'm not gonna be able to teach you um, tactical things because you're not going to have the foundation. So um, I think that just breaking it down, maybe showing them video or getting them on land to kind of sit by the edge of the pool and just kind of going through that motion um, will really help. And if there are kids that don't have any aquatic background whatsoever, I really think it's important to um, do the swimming and do all the water polo skills and swimming, kind of combine that together so you can get them to learn um, all of that quickly because they do get discouraged quicker if they're older and then trying to blend in with these like 12 year olds that already have all that knowledge. So those are a few things that I focus on with my older beginners. Ricardo, I don't know if you have any suggestions for like older beginners. Yeah, yeah, I do. I actually just did it. Uh, you know, I just got back from Brazil with the northern of Brazil, kind of much like the United States. You know, the, the sport is concentrated in that real Sao Paulo area. And I went to northern Brazil by the Amazon, that area there. And a lot of the kids were 15, 16 years old. And we even have a group of masters that came in, kids that just, you know, young people that develop, that, let's say, discover the sport later. Okay. Guys, that's okay. That's fine. You know, there have actually been players that have gotten to the highest level. Uh, starting at 14, 15, and 16. The only thing that's different is, as Brenda's already, you know, mentioned it, if you're a swimmer, then that transition is going to be strictly technique, okay? So if you come in with a swimming background already, what I recommend, there are some great exercises that you start doing with technique. And because you swim well and you got good posture in the water, we're going to be able to get to it right away and be the technique. If you are coming in without the swimming background, that's actually sometimes, it's not bad. It's actually it's not bad sometimes because what it does is that we'll come in and I do a lot of that work on, in the, on the wall. And I actually have some videos that you've actually how to teach that. You actually put a hand on the wall, for example. So you hold on to the wall and then I will teach them egg beater, vertical kick, scissor kick, vertical breast. I will teach them all that. And then I'll have them switch hands to switch hands. So you're starting to get feeling that comfort in the water and I'm not comparing them to young kids. Because at that point, they are already stronger. Because if they're going to be able to grab the wall and see a older, those young kids are going to look at him like, wow, that guy's good. You know, because you're now holding on to the wall. So starting with that, because everything, guys, I mean, if you don't feel good about it, if you're not enjoying it, it make it fun. I mean, there are some absolutely great wall exercises. Um, I have, as of right now, I have eight sets of 12 exercises for wall only. And most of those I use with kids, they are not great swimmers, 
or kids that have specific learning skills. So it's there and we can have a lot of fun. Let's see what else they have there, Brenda, for us. Yeah, and I think somebody was wondering if you'd be open to sharing that PowerPoint you just presented. Oh, of course. I have no problem sharing anything. You know, I, I'm not a believer in secret. You know, anybody that knows me knows that. I'm not one of those like, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody. No, anything I show you here, anything you ask, I will share. My, you can do it. I can do it through email. Whatever it is, I share everything. I don't worry. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. Here's the rest. So I walk and run as a guideline and mm -hmm. It's just to be ready as 17, college international level players, heading that way. Okay. Brenda, you want to do it first or you want to take it? Go for it. Go for it. Because I think it's in reference to your PowerPoint too. So go for it. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, what, what, what are we doing in here is this. I mean, so I don't, I never set a goal as an Olympian. I remember when Tony first asked me, you know, after I happened to be one of the coaches in the 96 Olympic games and Tony was a ball boy and he was a ball boy at the final game. And that's a 13 year old. And then uh, he's the ball boy. And of course he gets so excited. And you see the Spanish celebrating, you know, how the Spanish, you know, I'm a Latin too. And you know how we get when we celebrate and we drop to our knees and you know, we're just the whole thing. And Tony was really excited. Then he said to me, dad, I want to be an Olympian. And I said, no, you can't be. And he goes, well, why, why is that, Dad? And it says, because being an Olympian is not something you say, I want to do it. It's something that you plan. You have to have a plan. You have to have, to, you have, to have the mindset. You, know? you have to have the respect for the game. You have to have the work habits. So when I never think of anybody as an Olympian, what I think about is just like I do in my training, I want the second period to be back than the first period. I want the third period to play better than the second period. So we have to have this, this scale of thinking. So when we're saying walk, run, sprint, crawl, walk, run, sprint, you can set that up within your own high school, in your own age group. You can set it up within high school, college. You can set up college international. You can set up international Olympian. So you set your set, whatever it is. So when you create the crawl, walk, run, it's to your level. So if you already have crawled in a walk, but you still feel you're not there, then maybe your run becomes the walk and you've got to go that way. So I find that, you know, uh, much like uh, other programs out there, but when I was coaching high school, I believe I had 98 out of 103 seniors went on to play college ball. So there's a place for everyone. So, you know, we can go from there and about seven of those became Olympians. Those are some great stats there, Rico. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question that I see. Um, at what age do you believe in introducing competitive matches, fixtures for games? Um, in my opinion, I think that it, it kind of depends on, on your team and on the kid. Um, I was playing competitive games from age 10, 10 and under. In Southern California, we had this great um, – league that we were all in. It was co-ed. I remember playing and having a lot of fun. And I think when people ask me like what separates me from other people in my age group, I would say I probably had a hundred plus games on anybody in my age group because I had the option to play, but I had the option to play and I was ready to play. So that's why it made sense for our club. But I, I do think that it can't be that a kid plays for a month two months and then there's these competitive games i mean yes you could scrimmage yes there's a, like the four on four that rico mentioned in his um in his slideshow or there is a bullet point there's different ways to set up games without the scoring or like a smaller course or a, you score a point if you pass the ball to five of your teammates you score a point if you make um five dry passes there's ways for us to get creative to emphasize these um but basic fundamental skills that everyone needs to move on but i think it really just depends on on each club and each team if if they're the kids are ready. What do you think, Rico? Well, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, some kids are going to be able to play a 10 and under game. Same with Tony, same with Brenda. And you can kind of see that kid. But I've also seen a lot of careers ended on a 10 and under game. You know, uh, coaches can be yelling at the kid. I, I, you know, I remember one that I was able to get it back, and he actually went on to be a player of the year and then went on to be an All-America at UCLA. That had quit because of that at, as a 9 and under. Okay? So um, 
I, I think Brenda said perfectly. I was in Italy a couple of years ago. I was in Hungary last year. They play 10 and under games, 11 and unders, 9 and unders. There's just no score. There's just no score. So as Brenda said, create your own score. Make a pass a score. You know, we, we can do that. You can even do it without the goal. We even take the goal and put the little guy and make it like the pass is the goal. Okay, so because anything, a shot block, a steal. You know, we have this great game that we used to call them the Azzi Polo, that the points were scored only by steals and shot blocks. So if you scored a goal, if you shot the ball, they didn't matter. But if you shot blocked it, if you blocked it, that was the point. If you stole the ball, that was the point. Where it's scoring, uh, there's no point on that. Okay, so be creative and then jumping right in, Brenda, and I'm sure you saw what somebody just wrote right here, too, about uh, the frustration, the failure. Guys, there's no failure in this point. I mean, at this point, when they're little kids, what do you mean fail? They don't fail. I mean, you go to the training, you are the coach, just like you are the teacher in the classroom. Well, if you give a test and everybody got an F, you know, I don't blame the students. I'm going to say, wait a minute, I made this test too hard or they're not understanding what I'm explaining. So to me, if the kid is frustrated, the kid is failing, I'm gonna put the blame on myself. I'm gonna say, well, maybe I'm not explaining correctly. Maybe he's not listening to what I'm saying because I'm not speaking for, you know, with him. I'm speaking towards him. Or maybe I need to make it a little more fun. Maybe, you know, I want everybody to leave a practice with a smile, okay? And I'm not over gratifying here, guys. I'm not a believer of that. But I want the kid to leave a practice saying, wow, I had a good workout, I enjoyed myself, and I learned something. Those are three great things to leave a training. I don't want to leave a workout. One guy saying, like, man, I was the best I ever been. And the other guy saying, man, I never want to play again because I suck. Well, that's somehow the training wasn't devised correctly. Okay? It wasn't. You know, it goes back to the old style that, that they let the players pick and then the little kid that sits in the corner never gets picked. Can't do that. Plan your workouts, but that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. You know, we, we have had so many fun workouts over the years that we, we make sure that we come in, call the two or three Brenda's and Tony's and Maggie's on the team and say, hey, guys, today we're going to make little Johnny be a stud. But don't let him know. We're just going to make sure that whatever he does, you'll be amazed how that kid, when he doesn't know that he's being helped, he thinks he's just on the setting. He finished that practice saying, my goodness, I had the greatest practice in the world. I feel so good. From that point on, the kid fits in. So sometimes it's in our power as coaches to do that. And that's huge. What do you think, Brenda? No, I totally agree. And something that I find myself doing at the younger age level, and I know I saw something about joysticking for beginner kids, it's I remind them that the reason my voice is getting louder or the reason I'm repeating myself is because we coaches are on deck, there's a gutter, and we have these beginners that have water in their ears. So just remember, like, we're, we're trying to get them information when it's needed. Um, I don't sit there and, and joystick, but I do – it's, it's valid to remember just that it's hard for them to hear us. So as, as you're coaching, just kind of think about that and, and ways around it, whether it's bringing them in more often or talking to them outside of the pool, just so that um, they don't think that they're failing because they're getting yelled at all the time. It's just more of like, hey, I want you to try. I'm only talking to you because you can't hear me. And I think we had a question about the ethics of teaching, you know, younger kids, the dark arts. Um, I honestly don't ever go into anything where I tell somebody, grab this, do this, do that. Um, I, if anything, if a kid asks me, oh, I was being held, I'm like, oh, this is how you get out of it, right? Or the physicality of the game. It, to me, it's just like, it's a physical game. It's a contact game. Some things may happen. We're, we're hoping that it's nothing intentional right, that it was an accident. If I do see things intentional, um, I will go talk to the other coach and be like, hey, like, can you talk to this kid? I've noticed this. I don't know if I'm, if I'm looking at it the wrong way, but hey, can we have a conversation? I don't want my kids to be hurt. Um, so at that age, it's really important for us to just protect our kids and think of, of safety. And I mean, there's no teaching of, of the dark arts, at least in, in my polls there isn't. What do you uh, think, Rico? <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't even, you know, I, I think the dark arts means that they are basically teaching people that 
uh, hold or hit or kick or elbow. Well, first of all, any coach that is teaching that should be fired, in my opinion. Uh, there is no place for that whatsoever. Um, that's number one. Uh, the second thing is that, but the kids need to understand that the game is contact game, just like soccer, just like basketball, you know, and football, whatever. So sometimes things are going to happen, okay? But you can also do in your teaching process, you know, when I do talk with the kids, you know, there's a lot of dry land involved where we can learn how to protect themselves too. I says, you know what, mm -hmm. you know, that's why in water polo we swim with our head up because, you know, sometimes as you're swimming, people come together and you might get hit in the face. So if you have your head up, a lot of times you can see things coming. So use the positive teaching to anticipate what they call the dark arts, okay? Uh, there's a lot of twirling motions, 360 motions. We all can teach you. Don't teach the dark arts. Teach your 